Hello again, everybody. Hi. I am back once again with another one of my book reviews. This time I'm here to talk about a steampunk novel. Specifically, Dawn's Early Light by Pip Ballantine and T. Morris. This is the third volume in their Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences series. I, I have read the first two, though. It's been a while because while I really, really enjoyed these series, it's another one of those things that I don't like buying them because I got the first two in ebooks when they were cheap, but all the other ones seem to be priced ridiculously high, is in the exact same price for the paperback as, as they, they're charging for the ebook. And I just don't like paying that much. This one, however, went on sale a couple of weeks ago, so I picked it up cheap. And we'll see that I do enjoy it, and, and I will hopefully pick up volume four if it ever goes on sale cheap. So the general background is the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences is a secret ministry of the British government in Victorian England. Yeah, of course it's Victorian England because it's a steampunk novel, so I already said that, so if you know anything about steampunk, you know it's probably Victorian England. Main characters are Eliza Braun, who is a New Zealander, and as her last name suggests, it tends to be very physical and beat em up type. She's partnered with Wellington Books who is the name suggests is scholarly, a former archivist, but he surprisingly also has secret talents that enable him to be pretty good at butt kicking too. Plus he's good at inventing and stuff. And this particular book picks up right after where the previous one left off. They had just completed a case that they really weren't supposed to be messing around in. And so are sent to America to more or less get them out of the way, where they have to join up with the OSM, which is you know, the United States version of the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences. Their assignment is to assist the American agents in investigating some mysterious ship disappearances. That's airship and their regular old everyday ocean ship. And eventually they discover that a well-known scientist, well, I'm not going to tell you who it is, because I will avoid those kinds of spoilers if I can. Basically, this scientist has turned a lighthouse into a death ray, and they catch him at it, but then he escapes, and they spend the rest of the book chasing him across the country, while various evil forces try and stop them. You know, there's one called the House of the Usher, which... Is like has been a recurring villain in these books, and there's also another villain called the Maestro, who is a more or less a, actually apparently been behind the scenes in some of these books too. Hey, they're there, get get in the way, try and stop the agents, or try and stop the bad guys, or because they're not working together. And then there, there's also a subplot involving Prince Albert. Victoria's son, me Victoria, I mean, for those of you who don't know anything about British history, which would probably be most Americans watching this. Basically, it's about him. He's on the outs with his mama and his mother. So she ships him off to San Francisco, where there's a scientific exposition going on because Prince Albert is a scientist inventor in this world. And the bad guys want to either kill him or kidnap him, depending on which bad guy it is. The one group wants to kidnap him, the other group seems to want to kill him. And that's pretty much as much of a plot as I'm going to get into here, because it gets a bit complicated, and there's a good bit of romance and action and adventure and all that kind of stuff. Now, why don't I give you a little reading from it so you can get a sense of what the book sounds like and then I'll tell you my thoughts on it. Truly, 
there was nothing more delightful to Eliza D. Braun than a jolly good foot chase. Whether it was across London's rooftops in the morning, an afternoon tearing through the streets of Paris, or slipping in and out of the darkest shadows of a night in Cairo, the way muscle and sinew worked in concert with one another, and the exhilaration of a fresh quarry just within reach was a breathtaking, beautiful reminder that she was truly alive. At least that was what Eliza had told Wellington Thornhill Books Esquire at their first dinner together aboard the transatlantic airship Apollo's Chariot. Wellington had the breath knocked out of him as he skidded across the metal gangway. He scrambled for purchase, but it was ultimately futile, and he slipped free of the deck just in time. The archivist managed to catch hold of the scaffolding, its metal ch metallic chill driving through his skin. His grip tightened on the internal skeleton of the behemoth rumbling around him, which was the only thing currently keeping both his dignity and his life intact. Ahead he caught a glimpse of Eliza, continuing the pursuit that had started at her cabin, her skirt hitched up immodestly around her knees. It had been fortunate that they had returned at the very moment the intruder had slipped out of Eliza's stateroom. The thief was certainly fleet of foot and had led them a merry chase through the hallways and now into the belly of the airship. Now they were at least four full stories above the main cabin and climbing higher into the hall. Wellington could do nothing but admire how Eliza was keeping pace with the intruder. This is a very fun book. It's not one of those things where you were going to say it's a great piece of literature or anything like that, but it's definitely a good, fun book. You know, there's lots of good action in it and adventure in it, and some romance between Eliza and Wellington, which you could probably guess. So, you know, this kind of thing where there's one main male character, one main female character having adventures together, there's always going to be romance. I mean, unless they're like brother and sister or something. And there's also some good character development between the two of them as we learn more about them and see them struggling to get along better to see you know, there's you no know, spark of romance between them. They're, they don't always get along that well, just, you know, just like in real life. And then, like I said, there's a lot of good action and it's lots of fun. The only real problem I had was that, at times, this book seemed like it was working way too hard to set up the next book in the series. I, uh, introducing plots that basically tend to be more pointing towards what's going to happen in the next book than dealing with things that are actually happening here. I don't think that's a very major problem, though, because, I, like I said, I still enjoyed it. And it's not like those plots had absolutely nothing to do with the action here. It's just there was a lot of foreshadowing for what's going to be happening next. It's still a really enjoyable, fun read. And I'm going to give four gas masks. And I will certainly recommend that anybody who likes steampunk would probably like to check this out. I don't really know because I don't read all that much steampunk. I just mostly pick these up because the first two were cheap. I will have more book reviews coming soon. Until then, goodbye and good reading. If you like this video, please click subscribe or watch some of my older videos. If you think the book I reviewed sounds interesting, buy a copy. There are always links to the Amazon store in the description for this book and any other books I mentioned. If you have any suggestions on other books I could read, or any other comments, queries, insults, or anything else you want to say, please feel free to mention it in the comments section.